So, while we had all, I think, forgotten that Sting wrestled Ric Flair on the first and last episode of Nitro, I think we all remember what happened during this match. Because the bell rang, and they circled for a bit, and who should come strolling down the aisle but one Lex Luger? That's right. And if you were not around at the time, this was awfully, awfully big news. Because Lex had been spotted doing a run-in in the main event of SummerSlam 24 hours earlier. Yep. Correct. So this was a huge deal. Bischoff started screaming to get the camera off and have security take him to the back. Never he, m- he was selling this like it was an invasion. Basically, yes. yes. Not not a dude jumping ship. Right. And uh, never referred to him by a name, although he did later. So, and then the best part of this, Sting and Flair are both distracted. And then they got over it and they wrestled. That's right. They didn't do a distraction finish. <laughs> that was incredible. Wrestling used to be awesome. So, yeah, uh, we talked about this earlier. Sting and Flair have probably had 20,000 matches. They were all exactly the same, and they were all great. My favorite part of this match was Mongo saying he was stupefied by this action. Mm. My favorite part of this match, and it was just a little thing, they both fall out, fell outside. Flair, of course, pops up, hits Sting with an eye poke, and Eric Bischoff, as God is my witness, yelled, Vintage Ric Flair! <laughs> Uh, what's funny is yeah. that my favorite thing was what happened right after that because Flair uh, took a few steps back and then went charging in and ended up getting pressed land back into the ring. But he couldn't just step back and then attack. He had to turn mm-hmm. and go at about half speed. But then he reached out and he essentially hit the guardrail like he was running the ropes. Yeah. Couldn't help himself. That was awesome. So Arn Anderson came out to watch in a jacket that was, in fact, straight out of the mid-90s. Uh, I forget the deal, but he had a program with Flair going on. And uh, here was where they mentioned Luger by name. And Flair got the figure four. He grabbed the ropes and refused to break. So Anderson jumped in the ring. Ref called for the bell. They never really explained what the finish was. If uh, Flair was disqualified for not breaking the ropes or if Sting was disqualified for Arn's interference, but whatever. So Arn started brawling with Flair. Flair bailed to the locker room. And Arn returned to the ring, teased a brawl with Sting, but changed his mind and left. Yeah, the action was great. It was a fun little match. It was it was every Ric Flair Sting match you've yes. ever seen any time in your life. In all seriousness, was there ever a bad Sting Ric Flair match? I'd have to think about keep, it, keep but I, your mind I, they I were don't all think the same. so. Yes. I don't think so. This was also every Flair Nikita Koloff match you've ever seen. Probably, yeah. Actually, Scott Norton hit the announce desk, very angry about something. Probably heard the commentary about McMichael's. <laughs> he couldn't believe Mongo got the commentary that. job. I hadn't thought of that. McMichael got in his face. They had a, a great stare down. And, and say what you will about uh, uh, Michael the announcer, but Michael the tough guy talking trash with Steve, uh, Scott Norton was pretty awesome. And they did not have this on the house mic. It was just picked up by the cameras on the floor. And before they could get physical, Randy Savage appeared, said if Norton wanted to fight someone, he could fight me right now. Jumped in the ring and Bischoff and security held Norton back and never really went anywhere. I I, I guess they had to match the next show. Man, Randy Savage is just uh, overflowing with charisma. I know that's not like a... It, it's not like a revelation, but like sometimes... like It's been a while since I've seen much Randy Savage. But you, you just watch Raw. You watch all these boring people reading this stupid dialogue. And then you go back and watch Randy Savage being a madman. It's like, wow. Yeah. What a professional wrestler this guy was. Yeah. No wonder it's all the people talk about. You remember the macho man? Of course I remember the macho man. People ask me that every now and then. They'll ask me questions <laughs> like, do you remember the macho man? They know you write about wrestling. Do yeah. you remember the macho man? Macho man. Sounds familiar, but, uh, you know, <laughs> refresh my memory. Macho. Macho. So, on speaking of uh, people who, actually, there's no segue. Speaking of people who I had completely forgotten, I guess I completely forgotten, but Sabu wrestled in WCW for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. He had a Sabu video package of the very first episode. He's coming. It was surreal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely surreal. Messing with his mic a lot. What was what was surreal is I didn't realize he had had matches on WCW Saturday Night that they had actually taped the clips from. Yeah. Anyway, crazy the things you forget. 
14 yeah, it years later. It is. Bray Wyatt's dad cut a promo. Yeah, Michael Wall Street. I believe this was his debut as that character. Mm-hmm. He buried the new generation, which is what WWF was calling their roster at the time. He said WCW had the best wrestlers in the world from Hulk Hogan to Ric Flair to Vader and now Michael Wall Street. <laughs> he did have a great line about how he knew the IRS would be watching. And really, that may have been the last great moment of his career. The new generation is the few generation, uh, he said. He even had a uh, dollar sign on the lapel of his jacket, much like the million dollar man. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Hulk Hogan versus Big Bubba. Actually, a really good choice for a main event for the first Nitro. You're trying to grab WWF fans. Mm -hmm. Show Hulk Hogan having a rematch with one of his most famous rivals. Makes sense. God bless the boss man, Bubba here. But I thought he was quite bad in this match. Maybe I'm the only one. I hate that stomping headlock. I hate it with every ounce of my being. And in... To be honest, to be fair, he was overselling to such a ridiculous degree. You mean when he would get his head tossed into the turnbuckle? There was that. And he and, would fly back and look at the ceiling for 28, 30 seconds. And then Hogan pushing me, took a bump. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was fixing to really cut a promo on, on this guy. But then I thought about it, and it really made sense at the end of the match when uh, Ed Leslie... As oh. the Zodiac ran in, it, it hit me that this guy was wrestling Hulk Hogan. So the gimmick is you sell in the most ridiculous manner possible so that you become one of Hogan's buddies, mm -hmm. one of the guys he wants to work with, which ensures your employment. Sure. So at the end of the day, this made sense to me, but but watching the match, it was just like, this is ridiculous. He's just like, he's ridiculous in this match. Remember the match they had on Saturday night's main event where they were in the cage? Where he got suplexed off the cage? Yeah. Yeah. That was incredible. They took that suplex off the cage all around the horn. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I mean, Hogan blames his bad back on leg drops. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe it was 95 suplexes off at the top of a cage. So uh, we buried Sting's WCW theme earlier. I love Hulk Hogan's WCW theme. Yeah. I may be the only one. I thought it was great. But Michael said that Hogan cannot possibly lose to Bubba because he was too much of a technician. Was it mm -hmm. American made? American made. There are signs uh, from people who did not like Hulkster saying things like Hogan sucks and Hogan is a wimp. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's rocking out over there. This is a great song. That is quite the toe tapper right there. That it that gets your blood pumping. All it's right. time for action. Go ahead, Vinny. All right, so uh, Hulk, Hulk makes his comeback, hits the big boot and the leg drop. Kevin Sullivan and the Dungeon of Doom run out to attack. Oh, my God, this <laughs> menagerie of numbskulls. The Zodiac was just the worst. What in the fuck was Ed Leslie doing out there? I, I don't know. He had, a, he had his face painted, and he was wearing stockings on his arms, and he was gyrating in a gelatinous manner. And Kamala was there. Kevin Sullivan, was that it? Was uh, Shark there at this point? The shark was there, yes. yes. The earthquake. He ran in as well. So ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, Lex Luger returned. He hit the ring to make the save. Mm -hmm. And as they're both tossing bad guys out, they do the great bit where they're they're punching left and punching right, and they back up into each other and spin around and rear back and throw a punch. And they, they both don't, but they kept shouting at each other. That spot needs to come back, by the way. Two guys back into each other and turn around ready to fight. That's right. So the uh, Sting and Randy Savage ran out to hold them back. They went to commercial. And they came back. Gene Oakland was in the ring. Luger, Luger explained that Hulk Hogan wore the WCW belt. That made him the only world champion. And Luger was there to beat him. 
He was sick of messing around with kids. He wanted to play with the big boys. Wow. I was hoping you weren't going to say that. That's reset. It's <laughs> a terrible tagline. Now, their tagline was, it's where the big boys play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Hulk put Luger over as a star. He knew all he'd accomplished, but there were thousands of Hulkamaniacs standing, by, standing behind him, and he'd defend the belt against Luger next week on Nitro. Like ex- accepted, and he had a bit of a shoving match, and Savage and Sting broke it up again. It's so funny, looking back now, that uh, WWF was doing all of their uh, steroid testing, and then WCW just flat out says, this is where the big boys play. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, Jesus. And I'm telling you guys, as much as I made fun of the guy, you have got to watch this show and watch the Zodiacs run in. That right there is worth the the admission for this episode of of, uh, of Nitro, the debut of the Zodiac here on this program. It's just outrageous, this run in. So yeah, that was, uh, that was Nitro the, next week. The last bit, this is real quick. They spent one minute, they just went to the announcers, who recapped everything they had seen and said, here's what you're going to see next week. It mm-hmm. took one minute of TV time, and it made the show so much better. Dude, you remember how many times we've watched like these old shows on Classics on Demand, and they did the wrap-up like that? Mm-hmm. And it's like, every single time, it was great. And it, 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 I never saw a bad one. It, com- it completes the show you have just watched and also leaves you excited for next week's episode. Indeed. I know. And the lesson I learned from the one-hour debut of Monday Nitro is that in the past two decades, wrestling has gotten a lot shittier. <laughs> Well, just you wait. The lesson I learned from watching this is Raw needs to be an hour. That too. Well, that, that's right. I vote that we we watch the uh, one hour Nitro every week for a while because we are on track. We're we're one day off. Because okay. we're doing it on Tuesday. Yeah, because right. because this it's September third today, mm-hmm. and and we watch the September fourth oh, right. one. I didn't even think about that. So we can be watching them. They'll be they'll be hyping up Fall Brawl in September. They'll be doing uh, Halloween Havoc in October, Starcade in in uh, in December, and we can do a week to week recap for a while, and compare it to Raw. That's my vote. So Monday Nitro number two next next week. week. All right. I'm fine with that. I guess we All right, we'll do this. We'll do this for a while until we uh, decide we can't do it anymore. It should be cool for a couple of years. <laughs> a couple of years. Once sure. they start uploading those thunders, I don't mm. know. Next week, everybody, title match, as well as the debut of Sabu and the debut of Michael Wall Street. That's right. Don't forget about that. It is Wrestling Observer Live today. I'm Oreo the Orca. Do you have a blowhole rating system? Like, if you're really excited about a match, it gives you yeah, this, six squirts. This match was was uh, two and three quarter holes. If you must know. So I was watching this show, and they had a bunch of videos for this Liv Morgan about how all oh, my whole life I've been a wrestling fan. Oh, I'm gonna win my first title ever. There's children cheering and going, oh, you know what I'm saying? Okay. I do indeed. <laughs> hey, Danhausen, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear Danhausen? Hey. hey! Hey, look at that holy hey. mother of God. Look what we've done here. You broke a leg. Is that true? Uh, it was broken in half, snapped in two. The doctor said it was a tibia and a fibula. Uh, I'm a whale and not a doctor, but is it not a fibula and not a fibia? A fibula? What I know. Perhaps what? the doctor lied to Dan Housen. You know, Dan Housen, if you were a whale, you wouldn't have broken your leg. This is true because whales don't have legs. What did you grow up watching as a little evil man? Kane ripping off the door when he debuted. Yes. How old were you, Dan Helsen, when that match took place? Oh, about, uh, what was that, 1997, so about 700 years old. Oh. Also, one time Dan Helsen had Dolph Ziggler's theme song as his alarm, and it went off in class. <laughs> no, he didn't. Yes, it's true. Dan Helsen likes Dolph Ziggler. You like Dolph Ziggler? He's good matches. If you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.